Good morning. I'm Richard Miller, and you're never not here. We're on our new Hangout form formula, and uh, Hangout is uh, Google Plus, or Google has always given us such amazing gifts, and so the Hangout is a multi-person video chat room, and uh, I want to take this pretty far. So far, I haven't really ventured into five and six and nine people. And I don't know, that's a different kind of a conversation, and it really needs to be moderated uh, because uh, everyone wants to get a chance to speak, and then somehow it can't be just a free-for-all either. And who knows what we can do with this. We can have uh, periodic uh, meetings between the groups of people that can listen to each other and hear each other and, and uh, receive each other. And... Uh, that could be a value. We find that when we share it with another, somehow our heart is eased and we, and we feel uh, some growth or some, you know, some release of pressure. Uh, I've been in Australia. I've been staying with my beautiful friend, Rena. And uh, Rena's introduced me to a lot of people that, have been her friends for years on the Eckhart Tolle uh, TV, TV forum. And uh, so uh, here we are again. Uh, we're going to do a couple more uh, great people from that we've met from Eckhart Tolle. And so let me introduce uh, Susan Gordon. So hello, Susan. Hi, Richard. Hello. So you've uh, been a friend of Eckhart Tolle for, since the, the beginning, I, 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 I believe. Um, I, have been a, I have been a friend of Eckhart Tolle. I've followed him and his teaching since Oprah. A friend of mine just came over and said, oh, there's this teacher, he's, you know, wonderful um he's on he's going to be on oprah it's a worldwide webcast and i was like really hmm. i wasn't looking for a teacher <laughs> oh okay well worldwide webcast i want to see what he's selling because if it's going worldwide i'm already pretty sure i'm not going to like it and he's selling something and then i read the book before watching the webcast because i like to know what i'm like dealing with it doesn't sound very good does it but that's how it happened i read the book I, anyway i did at least think this is going to be big i want to see it i mean that was really basic i'm, I'm kind of changing things slightly the way i just tend to do that he's selling something because anything that's mass is already suspect in my mind and there it is you know so and so th since then and I didn't join the community right away. I was not the least bit interested. I've never been in a chat room or on a forum or answered questions on the forum. I wasn't interested. And then I jumped in. I didn't forget, introduce yourself. Why would anybody want to introduce themselves? No, I didn't even occur to me that you should do that. And I just jumped in and then I was stuck. <laughs> You were addicted, huh? I, uh, that's a great subject. That, before I uh, continue with it, I'll just introduce our other participant, uh, uh, Giri Samudra. And uh, <laughs> hi, hi, Giri. Hello, hi. Uh, I'm Giri. I'm uh, we all met at the Akatoli Forum, and it's wonderful to be here to to talk to talk to all of you and, and to be with you. Wonderful. Thank you. And Gary's uh, speaking to us from England, and I, gu I guess you're a medic or a doctor, is that correct? Yes, my profession is medicine, I'm a doctor, mm -hmm. for a certain time in the day. We think about our own lives, and then we read things, and 
By the way, the uh, the Oprah thing. I I watched all, almost all the Oprah sessions myself with Eckhart Tolle, and uh, I don't know. I was just thrilled that uh, that that type of a message was going out to so many people. Uh, you know, maybe at the time I was not following Eckhart Tolle. I had written it, uh, read his book uh, several years before. But I mean, I was just thrilled that uh, somebody actually was taking this message and putting it out in a, in a, in a really big way, and uh, and actually the sharings and so on. Maybe I, maybe I even judged them. Maybe I even thought that oh, they were kind of like beginners and stuff. But it really touched my heart so much that people would actually be, you know, actually a million people were were, were watching uh, these type of questions and uh, these type of responses and. Uh, and even though I judged the way Oprah handled it, that she always kind of had to have the last word or somehow she was putting Eckhart Tolle's words to her mouth. I do too. I you did know, too. know what? Whatever this is. <laughs> Who didn't? <laughs> but I mean, I just totally loved it. You know, I'm from Chicago. <laughs> Oprah was in Chicago, you know. Like, I was in Chicago at the time. I was thinking, oh, our hometown girl is really enjoying this. And I, I was totally loving it. It was amazing, and you know, when I first wrote the book, The Power of Now, I read it, in, oh no, I heard it in an interview, he said he kind of meant this book to be for a, a select group of advanced seekers, is what he thought, um, and um, he never expected, you know, to have such a vast audience, so really for him it's just, he's just rolling with the flow, it's only us who are just getting so excited, I think. <laughs> That's so interesting because I didn't know that, Gary, I didn't know that, uh, but yeah. I know that uh, after I saw the program, and I remember someone asked Eckhart a question about Oprah, kind of along the lines of, you know, what we were saying, Richard, about I judged Oprah for blah, blah, of course. I, I know exactly what you mean, but I would never actually believe what I thought. I mean, it's like, okay, so what? It's Oprah. That's what she does. It's her profession. and Or whatever. You know, it's, it's self-talk, but it's also like, you got to be kidding. Like, what do you expect of Oprah? She's just a person. She called him a prophet. I mean, she was so touched, and she's interviewing him. And she was authentic. She was authentically her. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Edward said once he said, "Oh, Oprah's a nice person," and it's like, "Yeah, great. What's wrong with that?" So <laughs> the thing is that I would tell people, friends of mine who were on, you know, really, they they are advanced. They're really they are, and they would say, "Oh yeah, but that's for beginners." And it's like, I am a beginner. Oh, how many <laughs> years? Is I am a beginner, whoa. And 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 when I meet people on Eckhart Tolle TV, Harry and, and, and Richard and Rena knows this too. The people who are there, they are advanced. That's what advanced looks like. That's my opinion anyway. I am a beginner. They're advanced. That's Let's talk about think. advanced. Let's talk about advanced because Let's talk know, about we, advanced. We, we, we uh, we absorb things, right? We read things, we look at things, we seek out things. Uh, we believe that we could uh, put some kind of distinctions on our experiences that will help us. You know, if we have certain distinctions, in other words, we modify our interpretation of how life is going and how life should go and and how the lives of others go, and and we look at you know what could be different about this moment, right? And a lot of that is kind of like uh, somehow receiving, or I mean, it's just typical. Uh, people watch television, you know, but they don't put on television shows; they watch it. People read spiritual books, but they don't write spiritual books, right? And then mm -hmm. somehow they're advanced. People get what they call advanced knowledge and advanced. Uh, and they can actually have advanced feelings and so on, but somehow those advanced feelings don't seem to happen in their own life structure, you know, in their own relationships, in their own business, in their own job. 
in their own uh, friendship circles. Somehow they're so advanced that their friendship circles and their and their relatives don't keep up with them, right? <laughs> Whatever that means, you know. And somehow uh, we get away from expression. You know, we said so many beautiful things when we met on our our testing uh, a couple of days ago. We were testing our all systems were go, you know, and we were saying that. What is it when we meet someone that uh, you know in a circle of friends, and we you know we don't know what to say because uh, it seems like we're supposed to be saying something called small talk, right? Small talk, and we're not very good at small talk because we're only good with with the experts or with people that kind of uh, speak in the way we speak. But what I'm trying to say, I guess, uh, in a long-winded way, is like, what do we learn from our own engagement? Whereas mm -hmm. this ex expertise comes more from uh, from just standing back and disengaging, and what you know, what can we really learn from disengaging? I don't know. Who wants to take that one? Susan, yourself? I'm looking at you, Gary. <laughs> 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 I, I mean, part of what we're doing here is. Well, I have two issues with the discussion that we have at the moment is it's not definition. When when you say advanced and beginner, you're making a qualification um, of a process of an engagement of a beginning and an end point. And the whole purpose of this teaching is transformation in this moment and the not even the transformation, no, the potential for transformation in this moment uh, is what the teaching holds. Um, and to test that, you need to, well, I, I needed to, I needed to let go of the thought that I need to do this, this and that in order to be at peace. Um, and that's one of the most subtlest, unexamined um, patterns or mental formulations that kept going in my mind. And I wasn't aware of it, you know, it was it was mostly based on spiritual rewards. So having peace to a certain extent from having done certain techniques, certain certain diets, certain methods, certain self inquiry processes, which would give a lot of release. But it would build up automatically without me realizing a process within myself. Um, where the technique was reinforced. So in my being, in my body, I could feel that the technique works. But the radicalness of this teaching is that you have to go beyond the technique. And as long as there's no ease, you will not get it. Um, and it's slowly percolating to me. You know, that, that is. So I don't see a distinction, and I'm not saying this out of arrogance. Um, I don't see it as advanced and beginner. I see it in terms of depth. So does a person have depth in spiritual practice uh, and a person have depth in spiritual wisdom? And those are the two distinctions I make. Yeah, uh, you can know if the practice is, is working. In other words, if the practice is actually taking you into uh, another kind of a space. But that assumes uh -huh. that, you know, being in that, that, that other space is, is necessary or that it's uh, desirable or that, uh, you know, we're all assuming that we should live in a, in, in a peaceful state uh, more and more. And then uh, I, can we question that assumption or is that true? Of course, if you assume that you should be some, in some certain state and you're not, uh, mm -hmm. that's stressful. And then... Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, anytime you say you, you give a model of something and say it could be this way, well, m most people are going to say, oh, yeah, it could be, but it ain't right now, right? <laughs> it's not that way now. It's so that in one way you're modeling so something that, could, that, you know, that's a positive thing. And in another way, exactly at the same time, you're modeling the opposite because for most people, they're not there. They're where they ever they are now. And mm -hmm. uh, isn't that more spiritual, uh, spiritually... Uh, I don't know what. That's like if we say, "And uh, right here, right now, is is all there is, and it's it's the meaning of my life and who I am is right here, right now." Well, then, 
the way I am right here, right now, is also the way it is, or the way it appears for me, let's say, and then somehow to bring people toward, to sink deeper and deeper into probably the way it appears for them, because <coughs> as of some value. I mean, have you ever questioned uh, whether whether spiritual practices? I do, yes, I do, very much. Um, I, I, as I was saying before, it, 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 to me it is to do when I realized there was a central point about two years ago. I was very rigid with my practice for about two years. And it was daily, rigorous, no breaks, no, you know, nothing should disturb. Um, but then that itself was very rigid, it wasn't fluid. Um, and there was a point when, I don't know, whether it was a cut or somebody, and I heard that a large part of being in an hour to go and pass technique. A technique can give you a taste. Uh, it certainly gave me a lot of taste, but to actually depend on techniques, you've lost it again. Uh, and for that to sink in, it took a little time for me. Um, I'll just say one more thing with what you were saying, Richard, uh, about people being focused and doing things and, and then going there and having a practice and a routine and a study and deepening. All of this, I don't know, for me, pain body is actually physical. It's physical and a little bit emotional, and I feel it on the energetic level. It's a very uncomfortable sensation. And when I access it, or when it kind of comes out, um, and when you are, when I become, when I become present with it, there is a massive release. And that release, you know, that mini awakening, that process of release itself is very pleasurable, if I'm making sense. Not the feeling of the pain body, the feeling of dissociation from the pain body. Those many moments when you, when you kind of dissociate, when you step back, when you disidentify. And it happens, and you keep, need, keep needing to do it. And when I did that, each time that happened, so for example, gaining insights and deepening process itself, that itself is an addictive process. If I'm making sense. I don't know if I'm making sense. Hmm. So there are two attachments that happen, I realize in myself. One was to practice and technique. Nothing wrong with that, but to be aware that there can be an attachment to practice and technique. And second thing was a very genuine thing that happens and is a very good thing. But paradoxically, the mind can attach to that as well, which is basically spiritual awakening. And to want that feeling, to want that release, to want that, that extraordinary peace that arises when you disidentify in, in real terms value. I'm not talking about some kind of a mental phenomenon. This, this happened. And then, once I dissociated from that aspect, a further deepening of body awareness up to me. So, maybe I'm more feeling now, I should stop. Were, were you making a distinction between thinking and being? Is that what you were talking about? No. Okay. I did not no. hear it. What I was saying, uh, Susan, was that, you know, in moments of intense self-inquiry or doing an intense meditation technique um, or in the midst of a huge pain body argument or an ego identification and you step back and disidentify, in that process, that mini awakening that happens, it's an intensely peaceful feeling. It is, in a way, it is a pleasurable feeling. And what I was saying was that they can become an attachment to that as well, to the spiritual process itself. The genuine release, the genuine spiritual release that has happened, you can well, I formed an attachment to that in the beginnings. Can you hear me, Susan? 
there there is something that's very basic that that um, is only what Eckhart Tolle talks about. I mean, he does not talk about anything else, and that is how everything, no matter what it is, whatever you call it, it happens only in this moment, and it is only accepting that, realizing that, accepting whatever it is that's happening, even if it's the echo arising out of Geary's kitchen, which is, it's fine. I just have to talk to myself, and I do that anyway. It's all what it's all about. And when you and I think this is what you might have been saying, but it, which is when when you are present and, and you accept it, you feel you're in touch with peace. That's like the beginning, in my in my opinion. But I'm fine with just that because whatever else is behind that will just happen. You know, um, I. I, I'm pretty sure we, we're probably on the same topic because that's all we ever talk about. <laughs> so how can we go up to a different topic? I just thought today, it was just like... Um, Sorry, that was just me. That's okay. That, in fact, Tom, I love Tom. Tom, I, you should, probably I shouldn't be mentioning names here, but we're just friends, right? And he's one of them. He, he's right. Of course, we're all right. When we give our explanations, it's the explanations that are different. And, and you can hardly help give one that it doesn't tie something down or, or evoke something entirely different than you're, it's coming from in terms of images or whatever in the other person. We are always, I, I realize that for myself, I agree with Tom, I have to tell him sometime. Every time I agree with him. I have to tell him I agree with him on that. I've always, I'm always present. We're all always present. Presence, the presence that we are is always there. And, and Eckhart Tolle is just pointing out that the ultimate importance of just like making that conscious. It's there no matter what's happening in this moment. It's there. And so I'm present. Like I am present now and someone could look at me and say, oh God, she's so like not. Sorry, I am. I mean, I won't argue with, I am. And, and then there's something else that happens then when I see how I'm, I'm not aware of it. So it's about first becoming aware of it and then the rest is kind of just takes care of itself. Presence has a certain signature, right? Because the opposite of presence is kind of like obsessed or or uh, concentrated on uh, obligations and urgencies and uh, projects and uh, and how to how to how to make a change. You know that I need a change. The idea that I need to change. I mean, not, that's also in uh, spiritual practice is there's an idea that I need to change or that I could change or that there's an opportunity to be different than, from this moment. And all these things, uh, the signature of presence uh, somehow doesn't have any, very much urgency to it or it doesn't have a to-do list or it doesn't have, you know, and you can still uh, have a lot of obligations and go through those obligations and be present. But the, the signature of presence, uh, uh, I've kind of made a definition, and uh, Mina and I use a, a definition uh, or a signature that we, uh, we actually prefer to say in presence, and we just call it the open space of good feeling. Mm -hmm. The open space of good feeling doesn't really have a lot of uh, anxiety in it. It has very little or none. And mm -hmm. then... Uh, People say just be in, stay in presence, and uh, uh, you know what your anxiety is gone. Or you know you could say it the other way around: just uh, drop your anxiety, and you'll be in, in presence. But we just call it something way simpler. We call it the open space of good feeling, and we all can feel a contraction, uh, a contraction, or a worry, or a, a concern, or a, you know. You can call it prudence. You can call it so many things, right? 
Well, but these are all, in a, in a way, these are all overlays, overlays on what's happening. Uh, and they're kind of interpretive overlays. And so then uh, we've been told and we've been experimenting that uh, it's really easy to manage the open space of good feeling because uh, a positive thought makes a positive feeling, right? It's like a 100% gear, gear, ironclad guarantee. And a negative thought, makes a negative close feeling. And, and so then lately I've been saying like a human is like, is like a piano. And uh, uh, the sounds that come out of this piano are emotions and moods, right? And one of them could be the open space of good feeling. And the keys, like are the white keys and the black keys, are the negative thoughts and the positive thoughts, right? <laughs> and the chords you play. And so then uh, let's... Richard, you know, how do you keep that... Uh what you're proposing. I mean, interesting, an interesting thing is that on the, on the forums these days, recently, most of the conversation is about conversation. And also a very interesting thing that was brought up was um, the pleasure trap. And you reminded me of that. I have to admit, that I tend to respond to what I'm hearing and talking now that I don't talk to myself so much all by myself in my head. I can be more quiet when I'm not talking or hearing. Anyway, that's a sidebar. But um, yeah, the pleasure principle. So how do you take the open space of good feeling, and I think you do, to uh, watch the Republican debates if you're an American? You are. I don't know if you watch anything like that down there, but um, but there's a comparable thing in Australia too. They're no different in England. Mm -hmm. So how do you, you know, how does that translate? I mean, that's maybe where the dissonance comes in. Once you really know that that is that is the place where you live, you live. So then uh, uh, I'd ask you to clarify a little bit, okay, what you meant by the pleasure trap. And then I think I understand what you mean by, uh, uh, you know, there are occurrences and incidents in your life that uh, do resonate through the body as a closure, you know, like something you reject. And then you're asking, what do you do about that? Do you just try to discard that, or do you just try to work through it? But uh, tell me first what you mean by the pleasure trap. Is that an identification with the open space of good feeling, or is that, mm -hmm. is that a running uh, after something that you're going to call uh, uh, satisfaction? Or, or what, what are you referring to with the pleasure trap? Well, I, th actually, it's not my idea. It was somebody else has noticed this on the forum. And, and we've been, it has been being talked about what is exactly the pleasure trap. So is, is there such a thing as a pleasure trap? And when you talk about good feelings and the open space of good feelings, although I know what you mean, and, and yes, of course, better to have an open space with good feelings in it than bad feelings, but are feelings what are included in that open space, good and bad, or are they what I want? I want good feelings, or do I want to be the space? Do I want that to be in touch with that deeper part? So in a way, when, when I asked you that question, I, I was really asking um, not what I feel, it's not what I feel coming at me from outside, it's the space that I am, can I take it all? And I guess I feel like that space that you're talking about, that you're referring to, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about it in your, in your understanding, is that that space, that awareness arises, the space is just there. And that has no particular feeling Feeling is not important to it one way or another. Opposites are not important to it. Values, value good, value bad. That happens when that connection is made between thinking, between acting, between 
obligations between life on earth and that. The pleasure trap then would be seeking the good feelings base versus avoiding the bad feeling base. Okay, my answer to that would be that uh, good feelings and bad feelings, both of them are probably weightless. They, they don't really exist. But somebody that believes that uh, bad feelings are real and then good feelings are real, and then they believe, okay, these two things are real and we have to take them both as they come, right? And then my bad feeling, why should I deny my bad feeling? Because it's really happening to me and that's what's up for me right now. And I think what I'm discovering is that there's really, uh, there's no substance to a bad feeling except that it's a, fueled by a bad thought, you know? And even if you say those Republicans are jerks, they're taking this, this country down into a terrible separate place where uh, so many people are rejected and labeled and, uh, and, you know, and you don't, you reject that. And that, and you know, that <coughs> your uh, non-acceptance of that, and I'm not saying accepting means to condone the whole thing or to join the club. Accepting just means something else. And we have to discover what accepting means. Okay, you're saying that, I'm saying that the good feelings and the bad feelings, neither of them are really real, and maybe there's no such thing as a uh, good feeling, open space, a good feeling. We know there's such a thing as a bad feeling, because we can contract, and we can, we can feel limited and scared and, and, uh, and resigned, and all kinds of things. We know we can feel that. Let's just say a good feeling, I don't know what a good feeling is, it's just the absence of those bad feelings, right? If it's the absence of a contraction. So actually a good feeling is nothing. A good feeling is the space that you're talking about. And uh, perhaps, how about that? You, you like that one? <laughs> oh. Can I have? The way, I look at it, the way I look at it is both bad and good feelings are the same thing. So they're both the same tree. It's coming from the tree of feeling. And the feelings have many branches, and bad and good happen to be one of them. So they're both essentially the same thing. It's also related and involved with the mind in terms of the mind seeking the pleasure and having an aversion to pain. They're both the same thing. So the process is the same. It looks vastly different. And without knowing, we are conditioned to go towards pleasure. Whereas they're both the same things. When you take up well, when I let pleasure and pain, both of them to just be as they are, the content outside is still there, but there is no inner content. And that leads to a lot of contentment. Mm -hmm. Susan, previously you were saying about um, we we're present now, we're, we're here now, there is no process to go, we're always present. And it's true in one level, but to talk about well, my nature is, is inclusivity. I look and see how I can include everything that's around me. Um, and I've heard Eckhart talk about this once before. Spiritual awakening and spiritual movement has, uh, has two forms. And I've kind of realized this before. There is an avenue for that intense um, process and that direction and that goal oriented you, you know, you have a plan, you go towards that. Um, and essentially what I talk about that is, is more of a seeking quality. And what you are talking about is more of a finding quality, or rather being quality. Finding quality. Finding quality, and which is more of a being quality. Um, and here again, there is an intense alertness 
that is needed. Oh, this is a personal process. Uh, I have known that when I lose that intense alertness, I slip from presence. I'm still present at a level, but my awareness of being present has slipped because I've lost that alertness. Um, so I feel that I need both the processes, the relaxed attitude of being where I know deep down that I'm there already, but also the alertness and watching in case something slips in. And that's the way I marry these two processes. And, and I personally feel both are valid, but to actually conclusively say, don't do anything, you're always present, you're right there right now, um, is, I feel is a way of this doing the service to that process, an intense process of directional awareness and process and technique that happens. Um, that is one. Uh, and two, how I came about with that flow. It's all right. It how I came about with that uh, kind of a thing is um, that there is a parallel movement. There's actually a lot of parallel movement with present moment awareness kind of a thing. Um, and um, there is a movement run by a, a couple who completely discount any of the spiritual aspects of awakening and spirituality and say, now is just here. We're just body, and we're just mind, and we're just talking to you here and now. And there is a huge following, and they justify it, and they propound it, and they speak about it, and there's a huge following worldwide. And they talk about mainly relationships. And I felt it was incomplete. Um, and I felt it was doing disservice to the depth of the potential teaching that can happen with present moment awareness. Uh, okay, one point is that uh, we're talking about just present moment awareness. Present moment awareness, in a way, is a relaxing. So then, uh, be here now. How do I do it? I, I have to just let go of uh, well, what I call my urgencies and my concerns and and uh, things that are actually uh, more interpretive. You know, how I uh, interpret this moment is that I need something. I need to do something. I've got special conditions. I, I've got to uh, follow up on. And so then uh, he's, we're in a way saying that when we relax from that, we're in a more open space. And, we're, and it is a good feeling. That's how we can recognize it, you know. And then, mm -hmm. And then uh, Giri's also saying, but I feel that's incomplete, that there should be some kind of an alertness there, right? Okay. And I don't know if that's a more masculine thing, that I can feel that too, you know? Oh, I, I know, like I, I, I know get... there are degrees. That's, that I understand what he's saying, yeah. I agree with so that. So what is that alertness? Let's just try to discover what he's meaning by that alertness. I would say that's kind of like a masculine thing where, like, in one way, it's like uh, our mind saying, well, I want to really do this, you know? I, I don't want to just let everything through the gates, which would happen if I was just relaxed. Yeah. I want to kind of aim myself toward uh, uh, higher principles, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so I want to be alert to those higher principles, let's say. And then he was mentioning maybe a couple that's teaching, like, let's just say that there's just here in this moment, there's now, there's uh, our minds, there's our emotions, and uh, let's forget all the spiritual overlay. And in, in a way, I mean, that spiritual, I mean, it, you put words to a feeling, and you call it a uh, spirituality, and uh, but yet it's just a feeling, right? right? The words aren't really what it is, you know. And so then, it's part in of a way, the yeah. human organism a feeling, uh, a negative feeling or a positive feeling. They're both part of our organism. Our body, mind, emotional organism has feelings, positive yeah. and negative. The spiritual also, part. also, Geary was saying that they're not that different. The positive or the negative are the same mechanism. In other words, it's part of the organism. Experience. They are the same in the fact that they're that they're um, equal. They're equal. That kind of sameness. However, I agree with you, and this is where the pleasure trap comes in. 
we also are happier and we like to be happy rather than unhappy when we have positive feelings and not negative feelings or when we have positive experiences and not negative experiences or we can't watch we can't look at that it it brings up something bad so let me not look at it because i can't bear it i don't like those feelings that come up you know so in that sense am i agreeing with you gary Mm -hmm. I don't think we are disagreeing or agreeing. I think we are exploring. Well, I mean, am I talking to what you were talking about? Because if you'd like to amend it, go ahead. Yes, you are. You are agreeing. You are. You are absolutely agreeing. Okay. The way I would. Yes, you are right, Susan. <laughs> no, no, that was that was good. That was good. And, and maybe you could add what because he. Richard, he had what I thought was like, this is a perfect definition of the masculine quality, feminine quality, and that you brought it to the forum. Of course, you could never tell if anybody noticed it, but I did. And what, what, so, oh, the masculine principle. Yeah, the principles, because all of this is part of that duality, the feelings, negative, positive, the male, the female, See, I don't oh, think masculine has a negative feeling and the feminine has a positive feeling. No, 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 I mean they're part of the duality. I don't think the duality. negative either. God forbid, mm. don't let that get out there. <laughs> masculine is beautiful, but it's part of the duality of the yes. world. Of the world. The masculine so in that sense, absolutely, I agree. The negative and the positive are the same. Um, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Okay, I'll go back in then. I'll go back in because uh, yeah, we're saying the, the negative and the positive are the same. But, you know, I would say the mechanism, the, you know, we said we have a body, the body has feelings. The mechanism of the negative and the positive is exactly the same. And what is that mechanism? It's, it's the story that we tell ourselves. Every okay. time, I would say that uh, if we're running with a story, it, it, and we're building it and padding it and, and, and finding proofs to it. Uh, we're building up our anxiety level and we're building up our closure. In other words, we're, uh, we're closing down more and more and more around a certain point. And to say that, that is, uh, that's part of a duality or something, that's not part of a duality. It's just running with a story. There's no duality. I mean, yeah. duality is to say that they e they're equal in the sense that they both have validity. They don't have any validity. Negative feelings or positive feelings. The only thing is, is negative feelings are running with a negative story, and they close our mind, and they close our body. And if you want to have your body closed, great. Uh, you can get a cancer. You can get a heart, heart condition. You can have a stroke. You can do all kinds of things that, that your body will do really good when you squeeze it. You know, you squeeze all the processes in it. And uh, well, if that's, if that's what you think is an equal part of duality, and you should just run with whatever it is, of course, uh, uh, Gary will like that because uh, at least his income won't suffer. He'll have more patience. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, his altruistic side will suffer because he hates to see suffering, you know, but his, his monetary side will like it because, you know, the hospital is, <laughs> is making a good profit this year. And so they could pay him, right? Doctors so that, uh, need patience. Absolutely. <laughs> But I'm saying that uh, going with a good feeling is just uh, managing you know, your your stories. You know, managing you know, the way you run with a uh, a fearful story and fear sells, right? And uh, uh, you know, and fear sells to our own temptation machine, whatever our temptation machine is, and that's the machine that that decides which story is important to us. And the fearful ones are like on the top of the list, right? Because those are the ones I got to handle. You know, and the pleasurable ones, like going to the Maldives or something like that, uh, that'll have to wait until I, I pay off my debts or something like that. that uh, you know, even if that's, that's not even pleasurable, going to the Maldives, it is one time or two times, or sometimes people get hooked to the beach that's and they the want, pleasure, they want to go it? off and, but tell me. That's the thing. Tell um, me, Susan. Pleasure sells also, you know, diversion sells. Feeling good is is a big trap. 
but what you're talking about, the mind and the story, that is true. That is so true. And that is really a very big thing in Eckhart Tolle's teaching because that's like illusion on duality. Everybody says that it's all an illusion. That's not quite right. I mean, yes, true. It's transient. It's not the same as it's all an illusion. But certainly that story, the suffering is optional. You can pretty quickly, it seems to me, get that and start working on the process, which is dropping the story, the added suffering. And so if you tend to see things negatively, I'm raising my hand here. I lived a whole life like that, or very lot of it, where I tended to have a negative self-image anyway. I never had particularly a negative image of other people, except as reflected, projected, whatever. But um, it's better to look at the good, the positive side of things. It feels better. It is better. It's at least a good attitude to have. But all of that is on top of floating over. It's kind of like floating on top of of the reality that's most important, which is the quiet space where that exists. Better to have happiness existing there. And even if it's a negative feeling rising up, that will just take its proper place. Kind of. um, the pleasure, that goes back to the pleasure trap, which is, which is, I always think, talk about whatever's on my mind. That was on my mind today. I was reading the thread. There I am. Just reflecting what's on my mind. I agree with you, but I think there's... there's yeah. I, I'm not too, too clear on the... the illusion on the illusion. It's the real yeah. illusion. I'm, I'm not too clear about what is a pleasure trap, you know? Because like at one time, Yuri was saying... Uh, our mind is set for seeking pleasure, you know, and I'd say that's not true. Our mind is set for seeking relief, whatever that relief might be. Right. And then relief pain. could come through the pain body, you know, because like the mind does attach itself to what we were calling uh, Eckhart Tolle, people call the pain body. And that somehow is a relief, I'm saying. And even your negative self-image, you said you, you, you don't tend to uh, uh, think you didn't in the past tend to think negative of other people and stuff, but you had a negative self-image. I was saying that that's a relief for you because of your negative self-image. You didn't have to go out and risk anything. You didn't have to go out and perform. You didn't have to go out and express. You didn't have to go out and, uh, and take a risk, you know, because you could, your negative self-image would beat you back down. And that was a relief for you because at that point in your life, you had a fear of uh, being judged, you know, and so then you became your own self-judge. I'm saying that was a relief, you know, and in a way that was your pleasure. And uh, what do you say about that? I mean, that's maybe a rough way to I, look at it. but You're right. I mean, I personally think that, that uh, either a positive or a negative self-image has its benefits and its deficits, both of them. Personally, I prefer having just let self-image part go. I, I honestly don't really care. And anymore, and I don't have, I don't beat myself up, or I don't accept other people's criticism. I listen to them. I might even act on them. I might say, "Hmm, is that true? Maybe it is." And even try. Sometimes it happens. I say, "Oh my God, you're right." But I don't. That's it. It's like having said that, I just keep on going. Just keep yeah. trucking. Yeah. You can feel into it. You can feel if it has any truth or validity for you. It's not really a truth. It's just something that you're hanging on to, and, and it's kind of like a belief about yourself is, is your self-belief. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I'm. you said now I don't have any self-image, but all of us have self-images. You know, I didn't that's... really say that. If I did, I yeah. meant it. I mean, it, it all of us I have some that. self-image, and... And, it, and I, I would say it's wise to cut somehow uh, manage it and somehow uh, see that it's it's open and opening. You know, let it be open and let it be unknown. My self image, you know, and it's there for sure. And uh, yes, sure. and it. let me let me take a bigger bite out of life, right? And then uh, a lot of fears will come up, sure, because yeah. uh, my self image is saying I can, that's too big of a bite. I can't take that big a bite of life. 
and let me try it, you know. And you know, all three of us are trying it today just by talking to each other and kind of not knowing uh, who's going to say what and if we'll look good or we'll look bad or if we'll have anything to say that's worthwhile or not. Or or maybe when we look at this uh, recording, we'll think, oh, my God, did I say that, you know. <laughs> Or I was unkind to those people. Maybe I was unkind. I might say that. Are you looking at yourself and saying, oh, my God, is that me? Who's that? <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe there's an immense value just in that, you know, to take an honest look at ourselves because it's so hard. Uh, you know, we, they, we say that the other people, other people are our reflection, right? And, and what, you know, even on the forum or something like that, you know, like, uh, okay, I tend to think that the forum we're talking, for those that are not familiar with Eckhart Tolle forum, it's uh, where people type in, you know, we type um, our reaction to people's questions and people's comments and we comment on comments and stuff like that. But in a way, there's it's less hard in it because everything is more or less a uh, concept, right? And we're, and we're having a battle of the concepts. I don't know. What do you guys think? <laughs> I think there's a lot of a lot of joy in that, right? I don't understand it, but on the other hand, you keep talking, I don't have to. So. It, it brings us it brings us to that point how we started and, and we were talking about that relaxed approach and then the alertness and Richard you mentioned the masculine principle um, how we started off at this time at this moment was to not have an agenda it was relaxed it was open and that I would be akin to the feminine. There was only an intention. And the intention was to come in and to share. Um, and I have the advantage because I was stepping back over the past few minutes and just observing, just observing both of you. Um, and the ideas and the concepts and the concerns that were brought when we first started, for example, the pressure trap. <coughs> Um, or the positive and the negative experience is like uh, is like a stimulus is like a, is like an external alertness that came into that into our field of intention, which was to be here and share, which we are doing still. So that's happening on the background, but at the moment, I'm providing an external masculine masculine stimulus, which is a concept, an idea words which are directed, which are pointing to something. Um, and if I'm di talking directly now, because if you're not careful, as my words are coming out, you're forming internal images and concepts. And what am I going to tell him next? Or what can I speak about next? Now, that is an immediate reaction. So an internal alertness is absolutely essential and a must. In that sense, I, I meant that it's, in a, it's a must. And I'm giving a very crude example over here um, in the sense that we have, we have to maintain alertness for our minds not to come in and, and say, oh, I can tell that next, or I can comment on that next. So yes, that relaxed state of awareness um, and the intention of coming here, which is the feminine principle, but also the masculine principle, for while I'm speaking, internally you shouldn't be reacting. Because if you are reacting, then we won't be communicating. And how we were speaking about both the negative and the positive being different and then I remember, Richard, you had disagreed. But then in the process of communicating, you actually said that 
well, it came about in discussion. I don't know if you said it or Susan said it. The negative self-image can actually turn into positive. So that is a relief you know, that, that was being mentioned. And then the positive can also become negative. Um, so essentially they can invert each other depending on the way we look. And in that sense, I was saying it comes from the same place, but it's perceived differently. And the pleasure trap, I think it has the answer in itself, trap. Um, so we feel trapped. So in that seeking for pleasure, in that attachment to pleasure, um, and aversion from pain, which is the same thing as what I'm saying. So attachment to pleasure and aversion from pain is the same internal process, but it's perceived very differently on the outside. I don't know if I came across, Richard, does that make sense? Being perceived by other people or perceived as what uh, as what manifests differently, they're the same thing, but the manifestation is is different. Perceived different, it is different. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it's, the perception is different internally. I'm not quite going in that direction, you know, with my thought process. In other words, like, for instance, I said uh, uh, negative self-image as a reward. But I didn't really say it was it could turn positive. I just said that uh, uh, a, a kind of a stern way to look at our lives is that everything that's really taking place is what we're most committed to, uh, even when we don't know that. In other words, when we're suffering... Uh, somehow it might be our commitment to that suffering, you know, what keeps the pain body in place, you know, somehow we're committed to uh, saying that we're, that we, we want to honor the things that did not work in our life, you know, the abuses, we want to honor the abuses in our life more than we want to honor this moment. And maybe this moment is a mundane moment, right? And I was saying in the case of a uh, negative self-image, uh, somehow we have a fear to step out and take a bigger bite out of life. And so then uh, we use our negative self-image to hold us back and, mm -hmm. and hold us from our true potential as a human being. Mm -hmm. And then, for that, you know, that seems positive. In other words, we're getting a reward for that because our fear is being rewarded and our fear is not being pushed to the limit. Uh, it's being coddled and it's being, uh, you know, we put our fear in a, in a baby crib and put it to bed and say, look, we're not going to, Dress you out here. Uh, we'll stay here, and we'll just be real humble people. And maybe, you know, anyhow, what do we do? What can we say? Who are we? We have no education. Uh, we don't speak the language very well. Uh, you know, whatever our negative self images are about ourselves, I've never finished what I start. I, you know, whatever our parents told us that was no good about us or something. You know, we oh, know. sorry, is that what you meant? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, that's what I meant, it's... you know, and I'm just saying that there's a really a reward to everything. And if we take an honest look at that, then we can say, well, gee, that's not equal. You know, a positive and a negative are not equal. The negative is just kind of like our, our workaround to a life that uh, we've kind of given up on, a life that we've kind of uh, been resigned to say, well, I better stay the way I am, you know. And, uh, of course, in one time in, in human history, uh, there was no talk about crossing over or about it succeeding or about being anything else than you were born into. You know, you were born into being a shoe, shoe, shoe cobbler and you would just be a shoe cobbler uh, and so would your children. Or you were born into being a, a serf and you would just be a serf. You would never thought about why am I not the noble, you know, and you never had to do, stress your, your mind. And then at a certain time... Uh, uh, there is a construction of a citizen. Uh, you could be a citizen, right? And then what, is, you know, what does that mean? I get to participate in life in a different way, in a bigger way. And uh, maybe I can vote, you know. Maybe I'll vote somebody in, right? Or maybe I could run for office and uh, I'll be voted in. And, uh, uh, well, that's just one example of, uh, of how life on Earth uh, progresses and how... Uh, we're in some kind of an evolutionary path, which is not necessarily a biological evolution, but it's a psychological evolution or a social, social evolution. And uh, 
you know, much of our spirituality uh, kind of discounts the social evolution and just says, oh, those are all thoughts and you can just be in peace. And then uh, hocus pocus, we'll, we'll call it grace, will fall on you. And if you're a good spiritual boy, and be real quiet, and uh, you know, and do your practices. Uh, someday, some shazam will happen, and the uh, and the grace of your guru will come down on you, and uh, then you can be a guru too. And then, uh, you know, or otherwise, at least you'll be peaceful. Be a guru too. That's the that, that's the. That's the trap. Maybe we don't call it the pleasure <coughs> trap. Maybe we call it something else. Let's call it something the guru else. trap. Well, what is a, Why would you want to be a guru? Because you want to contribute. Cool. You want to contribute to life, you know. And you haven't been. You know damn well you're not contributing to life. Okay, you're taking care of your husband. You're taking care of your kids. You know, uh, you were in the PTA once, but they they shouted you down. <laughs> and so, and you so then you said, no more of that. No more of that cool. business. <laughs> you know. I mean, it's kind of like, it's just like how we uh, move toward life and how we back off of life. And you can call it a pleasure trap, but I don't know. I think that is total bunk, you know, total and complete bunk, you know. Like, uh, let's say you got, you, you move toward pleasure and you move toward good feeling. Let's say that uh, something in your body takes you to a place where there's clean air and where the oxygen is strong, you know. And you're saying, oh, you're on an oxygen trap. You know, I mean, wh how ridiculous could it be? It's just your natural reaction to move towards what's right for you and your body and your organism, right? And what feels good, and it is. You're absolutely right. I would not disagree. So what's wrong with a pleasure trap? I mean, it's just idiocy to, sit, to talk about that for me. Yeah, I mean, I would just say that, of course, you move toward, you've got bad feeling and good feeling, and, not, and that's a signpost for you to steer your life by. And take right? your bad feelings out of my life because they make me feel bad. Yeah. There's that part. Yeah. Take your bad feelings and go home. I don't want to. I think the, <laughs> the, the, the issue was here was, was a trap in the sense where you're wanting the pleasure feeling all the time or you're chasing after the pleasure feeling, uh, which was the trap part of the things. That's the way I read it. That's what? the way I see it. Say it, say it again. Could you the wanting, the wanting of the pleasure, wanting. or the seeking of the pleasure. Because that open space is free of wanting, actually. The, the, the space of presence, maybe the space Richard's talking about is different than the space I'm talking about. The space I'm talking about, and I think actually we all are, is, is free of pleasure and free of it's free of want. It's free of desires, like for pleasure seeking desires. It's completely okay. And but that is not living in this world. We live in the body, we live in the in the mind and senses and emotions. We don't have to live in the thinking mind. Oh, we sure as heck do. So what a denial. That's a crazy denial, you know? We have to, we have to think, you know, and to say you're not thinking, and how the heck do you get out the door? How the heck do you handle your bank account? How the heck do you drive a car? We're all thinking, and to deny that we're thinking, I mean, uh, what's the point? I mean, we can be peaceful, and we can, and things are on automatic, and we know how to drive while we're uh, talking on the phone, but it's not really a good idea. They even make laws okay. against it. I'm not even very good at it, so I don't do that. But, I, I agree with both of you, but I'll just qualify the statement in the sense presence, there is no desire, there is no suffering, or there's no pain in, in presence, um, or the fact that in presence there is no thinking, um, actually possibly not true, there is pain, there is pleasure, but there is no attachment to either the pleasure or the aversion from the pain. So it is that that response to that stimulus, yeah. or even the thinking mind, which is always going on, but there is no awareness usually, but in presence, there is the awareness of the thinking mind. So the thinking mind can be going for a run, for a job, for a walk, doing what it wants, but there's no awareness of the thinking mind. And um, so you're both right. No, we're all right. <laughs> I think we're all right. You know, you like you say that there's no, okay, we're saying there's no attachment to the pleasure or the pain. Where, I don't know, you know, in enlightenment, let's say, or something like that. But sure, there's preference. There sure as heck is preference. 
call up a spiritual teacher and start to abuse him. He'll hang up on you for sure. You know, I mean, there's, there's certainly preference and there's certainly attachment to that preference, right? And so then that's baloney too. I mean, why even say it? Why say what? Why say that there's no attachment to pleasure and pain? There is. There is that's what we're made out of. And that's our signpost of how to live. If we didn't have a signpost, if you had no pain in your body, you'd make all kinds of terrible mistakes. You, I never said a, you, you, would miss, you would have a sign. You would be missing a signpost that uh, tells you how to live and how to be healthy. You've got to have uh, pleasure and pain, you know, as a uh, signpost uh, indications of what's right. You know, when when you're a kid, and you let's say when I was a healthy kid and uh, a young guy, young man, and I I was uh, I was doing a lot of physical work and a lot of physical activity, I could burn through anything. And I didn't really have signposts that said, don't drink this or don't uh, overindulge in that or don't, because it would all burn out, you know. I could just burn through it. I had that power, right? Uh, and so then you were without those signposts, I made a lot of mistakes. The pain and the pleasure is there. It's, it is there. It's not that they're not there. In personal experience, when in presence, I found that I'm not too attached to either the pain or the pleasure. It is there, and it's a passing phenomenon um, when I'm in presence. Um, but when not, I find that I have preferences, yes. Preferences is there, and it's not there in presence for me. That's an experience. I don't know about enlightened people. Well. <laughs> okay, I want to ask another question. Let's shift gears a little bit. So let's say uh, we have a worldview, and we pad that worldview every day by our experiences. We, they either verify our worldview or they tear it down. And then up to a certain point, we're allowing things to tear down because I think, I, I don't know if it was Geary or, or Susan that was saying that uh, there was a, okay, Geary was saying there was a relief in certain things uh, came apart or, or when they were, there was a let go that uh, allowed a relief. Uh, and so then some of our, some, okay, some of the, so we adopt, uh, we have experiences. Uh, number one, we have experiences. Number two, we interpret them. The interpretation is a story and that story either adds to our worldview or it subtracts from our worldview, which might be good. We might even be trying to get out of, you know, our worldview might be that it's a terrible place and we might have come from a country that was uh, strife and war torn, and uh, we might have all kinds of our worldview that's uh, very heavy duty, and uh, we're trying to release some of it. So then, what? And so here's my question now: What is it that uh, somehow is the temptation that we're going to adopt some some uh, new interpretation? And what is it that? Uh, uh, that tells us that hey, we're not going to accept this new interpretation. This must be wrong. And uh, how do we manage our, uh, this story uh, uh, about our life, about who we are, you know, our worldview and where we're in it, who we are in that world? How do we manage the story? Well, first, Richard, do you, you I mean, do you think that things that have pleasure and the experience of pleasure the experience of pain, physical pain, uh, experience at all is the same as being attached? It's not. I don't believe you believe that. You said that. I don't believe you believe that. That it, being attached to pain is the same as the pain. You said that. I don't believe you believe that. Do you believe that? Uh, let me try to... Uh, it's a challenge. Get back into what you said, you know, being attached. I don't know if I said attached. I was saying, uh, you know, that people have preferences, right? And, yes. Uh, and I was also saying that people are attached to their pain in the sense that if it gives them something in, in the end, it gives them some some uh, some reward that for them is important. And, uh, and okay, in, in that I case, have... I was talking about the self-image and I was talking, about, that was the one. There could be other pains. I mean, mostly, uh, I don't know what would be another pain you're attached to. You're suffering. You're suffering, and you're and you're and you're uh, 
abuse. Your your memories of abuse could be important to you because it uh, it's a story that makes you important in a way because you had more abuse than the next guy, and so then it's one way you can shine because uh, and then you then you dramatize it. You know, I don't know. I mean, in a way, drama, any kind of drama. Well, maybe this is another story. Any kind of drama is a manipulation. Why well, that's an explanation. It's not necessarily a story. And so I guess if it were me, I'd want to say, and is that, you know, is that a true explanation or is, is there some attachment in it? Because for me, attachment is a very key word. It's like, yes, you have opinions. Yes, you have preferences. Yes, you prefer doing this activity over that activity, whatever. There's lots of things. They're fine. They're part of life. It's the attachment that to me is key. And explanations are stories, but they're not the story that's that's full of attachment. Anything that is not happening right now, using words is creating, not truth. It's a story. It's an explanation. It's an opinion. It's a description. It's, it's a comment. Okay, an attachment. I, I suppose uh, sometimes we make rules about our lives. And we'll say, never again will I allow this. And then if we have these ironclad rules, uh, that's, let's call that an attachment then. You know? Yeah, and, and what happens when you have those kind of things? We all know what happens. Or if we don't, we should think about it. Because what happens when we have ironclad rules? What happens? Well, what happens is most of the times they're not fulfilled, right? And so then we're always fighting against them and trying to make them, you know, force them on the situation. And, Suffering. Uh, yeah, naturally they're not fulfilled. So then we feel like, oh, my God, things are going all wrong, you know. And I have to uh, up, the, up my energy level to, uh, you know, force more, you know. And so then uh, I'm becoming less popular. <laughs> well, sorry. <laughs> no, the question is why? Uh, what? Uh, what? Uh, what allows you to choose your story, right? Uh, whether it's attached or whether it's not attached, even a preference is some uh, light attachment, right? Because that's the way you believe. You believe that that must be closest to the truth, if there's such a thing as the truth. But uh, what is it that uh, you know? I mean. To me, that is what inquiry is, you know, and where the fertile ground of inquiry is to inquire why I'm choosing this story and why I'm tempted by this story and why I'm trying to pad this story. Pad means uh, uh, gather evidence for it and, and uh, build a support. Uh, yeah, support for it. Yeah. Which, in, in effect, makes it more and more fixed. Right, I'm trying to really fix it, and why don't I just be, get flexible and just uh, let other stories come in and out, and especially other people's stories, you know, like, okay, look on the forum, you know, uh, the Eckhart Tolle forum, we're so much wanting to put our opinion out and have people somehow adopt it or at least uh, see the validity of it or give us some accolades for, oh, that's a really good way you said that. But in another way, uh, we're not really respecting that everybody lives their life by their own interpretations and their own and their own, uh, you know, default mechanisms, and uh, and they go back to their favorites, and their, you know, they have their own uh, 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 attachments, let's say, that are these fourth, where they're trying to force uh, an old uh, uh, scenario onto a new uh, uh, occasion, and uh, you know, we've done that, and we know we've each done that a million times. We should be able to respect it in the other, but somehow. Uh, no, forget we, done. Forget done. I do that. Do you? You know, I forget done. I, I do that all the time. But is it something that's chosen? And does it really matter so much? I mean, is it the most important thing? It, it's, it's kind of what you gather along in your life. Um, you're born in Chicago. You're born in the United States. You, you grow up drinking Christian water. Whether you practice Christianity or not, that's how you grow up. Probably if you're born wherever Yiri was born, in India somewhere, you may grow up drinking Hindu water, or you may grow up drinking Muslim water, or lucky for the Indians, they're all kind of mushed together. They grow up with interesting water. But 
that forms their story. And if, if we're talking about anything, anything at all that isn't happening right now, if I tell you what I did today, it's a story. So what's important? How identified I am with it. I think my story is better than just as you were describing, in fact, right? How identified I am with that story as being the truth. What do you mean that's not what happened today? Well, it was, but it's not every, It's not the whole picture. It's only the picture I saw of what happened in my space. I do not usually know, I'm aware of the whole space of, of the experience of what's all around me at any moment. Not completely, although sometimes you are. Really okay, one thing you're saying, Susan, is that we're all soaked in a collective, you know, and if we're in uh, if the U.S., we're in Christian waters, you know, and we can know that, but we, you know, if we can see that, we, we, we might never, we, it might never happen that we see the, the full ramification of that and how deep it goes, how deep those waters run, yeah. you know, in our judgments and so on, but somehow, little by little, we can also inquire into that, and that's what I'm saying, it that your story and, and what story you choose and what story you didn't choose that you were just immersed in, uh, this could be the, uh, one of the most important inquiries. And it's not just because the story is extraneous or uh, doesn't have anything to do with it. It's because I'm saying a story uh, really uh, totally controls your feelings in every, every situation. And that's an inquiry, too, that you can start to notice uh, if it's true or not for you. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, when I say story, I'm saying, okay, story that's conscious, but also story that's subconscious or unconscious, like what we were saying, Christian Waters. And uh, 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 that, to me, is the real inquiry, because then that is what allows for presence, you know. When we fall into our default thinking mode, it's because we're in some story that says we need to work it out. We've got problems to work out. And if we were in a... If we could uh, disable some of those stories, diffuse them, uh, we would probably say, hey, we're blessed. We're humans, and we live on God's earth. My God, how great it is, you know? And we can also arrive there by a story, too, by saying that we're praying to God and so on and so on. But, I mean, when we diffuse the, the, the urgencies of the story, then we're left in presence, I believe. And then that presence uh, uh, makes our life what? A lot, it's an opportunity for life to be more appropriate because uh, we're seeing uh, what's happening uh, with less overlays and we're actually seeing more of the truth of it. Like even the three of us here, I believe that uh, we can feel each other's heart and we can really feel each other. And uh, whatever that well, means, that's a spiritual like, speech. I like, but... I like you both. I can't, I can't see into your soul and or your heart. I know I feel the... I, I, I just like you. So there, I can say that. I cannot see into your soul. I cannot see into your heart. Just see into your own soul. It may be a reflection of mine. I believe that, that that's true. That, that um, to a certain degree. But that's just a belief. I don't know if I could say any more about it. What do you think? What do you think? Tell us a few things. And we'll pull it to our clothes. Give us a final I argument. Know. I don't know. There's a question though I would like to ask is what happens to the story after it's been unplugged? After the access presence or after the inquiry has been made and presence is is grown or is growing. What happens to the story? Is it still there? does it go away? I'd like to answer that, you know, and actually uh, that's exciting because uh, we're living a story and we say we're in a collective and uh, uh, and we're saying that uh, a lot of that, collect okay, the collective story we didn't author. Somebody mm. authored it for us, our forebearers, right, authored the story. In fact, we, we read scriptures because our forebearers had a story. And we try to emulate that story, right? And what happens when you look into the story and see that it's, in a way, kind of arbitrary and a lot of it is the collective and a lot of it might be the collective resonating through our experiences 
as a youth, it was still a collective that was resonating and, and kind of coming to the surface through our own experiences, which were similar to those original stories. And when we see that those are just stories and we're, we see that they're actually constructed of, uh, of, of words, of distinctions, and then we can start to make our own distinctions. And we can say, well, what, if, I, I, if I'm a human mechanism operating on a story and, and each story has a feeling uh, that, that, that ricochets through me, well, why don't I try to be the author myself or with my friends? You know, the three of us could say, let's make a story. Let's, and we call that story a, uh, uh, an opportunity. Let's just say it's an opportunity for, uh, for a context for opportunity, let's say. A context that we can build one and, and we, can, we can create. And we can say, oh, yeah, those are just thoughts. But anyhow, they're thoughts that might uh, make a difference on the world of thought, you know. And the world of thought would be how human society works, you know. Let's just include more people somehow or... We'll make our own stories, and then that's my. And that's that, I think that's the power of it because there's a great power in the story. We're all plunging along in this life, uh, trying to get our story tied together. You know, like whether we're working or whether we're trying to satisfy our boss or whether we're trying to uh, bring uh, greater health to the world or we're trying to raise our kids better or take care of our spouse or whatever we're doing in this world. In a way, we're just we feel it's a necessity that we didn't create. You know, if we had to write it, we would have wrote it different, the script. So then when the story starts to dissipate or to be seen through, then we can say, well, let me put a chapter in that story. Right? I want it to be this way, where I love people and where I'm more open and where I'm not so scared to go out and, and tell people that. And then uh, maybe I'll even get on the internet and just broadcast myself, right? <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, let's talk about being a couple or what have we learned about being living with a spouse, you know? Or how can people, uh, uh, you know, why do they have to get divorced so many times? Or, you know, or any place that we like. We could talk about orphans or we could talk about uh, uh, kids in third world countries or we could talk about food or we could talk about, you know, we could pick up something and build our own conversation and call it a conversation for possibility. You know, it's not really here yet, you know. But so you're saying we are... I'm committed to that. I'm committed to... I could commit myself to that. Yeah, please. So uh, the, the energy of that I got was that we are, we are realizing our potential and we are becoming floating fields of intention. And um, by the internet, we are almost changing the collective intention purely from the place where we are. You in Australia, Susan in America, me in UK. And at this moment, and, and our it's intentions done through, are it's colliding. Done, yeah. It's done through language, but also uh, an important part of that language is that it's built on no thing. So that the spaciousness that spiritual teaching uh, brings us to is the platform for creativity. And so that it's not to be discarded. It's not either or. It's not just thoughts or otherwise just no thought in vastness. It's both because the vastness is the, is the field of creation. And then the creation is the word. And then, uh, it, but that word is just built on attention. It's not built on uh, residue. And uh, how about that? You have some great words that are kind of out there with no real definition. That we need another conversation to kind of like settle this down onto ground. I'm Taurus. Yes. <laughs> it's so nice talking to you guys. It was very nice meeting you, Susan. Yeah, Thank it's you. fun, right? Is this what I expected? Well, actually, yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful conversation. I just, uh, I'm um, really we'll thrilled by, it, by the three of our yeah, energies. But um, there was something I really want to, you know, I'm a woman, and I like to have the last word. It gives me pleasure. And you know how that feels. But I can't think of what I wanted to say to you, so I'll have to, like, type it or something. Okay. I love you both. Beautiful. Bye. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm late. I love you both. I love You're you. You're beautiful. Both. Perfect. <laughs> All right, Richard. Thank you. Thank you.